becomes an issue. Or they said, okay, look, audit our financial statement, but your fee is going to be, let's say, uh, let's say five percent of our profit after tax. That is the auditor financial statement. So what does that mean? The auditor have to ignore all revenue manipulation, expense manipulation to ensure that the profit after tax is as high as possible because that is what will determine his own money, his own fees or our own fees at the end of the day. So incentive based fee arrangement could actually compromise auditors independence and integrity and this safeguard the only safeguard to that is that the auditor should not accept an incentive based fee or contingent fee arrangement the fee should be based on the work done for the client concern over employment security could be a self you know interest threat the auditing members are looking for security they are afraid that they are going to lose their job so before you know it they start fraternizing with the client staff and things like that they want to perhaps they want to cross to the client's uh, 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 company so they are ready to you know manipulate books to please the clients commercial pressure from outside the uh, employing organization could also be a self interest rate inappropriate personal use of corporate assets all right could be a self interest rate close personal or business relationship with the clients could be a self interest rate it should not be encouraged for example the auditor is a family member of the auditee such an auditor should not be on the audit team holding a financial interest in a client or jointly holding a financial interest with the client I think we've already talked uh, about that. Undue dependence on fees from a client. When the fees from a client is becoming maybe up to like 15% of the fee that is being collected by the audit firm, then pressure will be on the audit firm to ensure that that audit is positive. And of course, gift and hospitality can create a self interest rate. By the time you are collecting material gifts from the client, you become a slave, quote and unquote, to the client. You can become, you know, easily manipulated by the client. So the editor has to be careful to ensure that the audit team members do not receive material gifts from the assurance uh, client. All right. What about self review threats? Like when I was talking about compilation and gave my thoughts that sometimes the auditor may be called upon to prepare financial statement for the auditee. And in such a situation, by the time the auditor is reviewing the financial statement again, you're actually reviewing your work. Or in a situation whereby the client has outsourced the internal, uh, the, the accounting department to the auditee. It happens sometimes, you know, the audit, the client may have assigned the accounting department to the, to the auditor, auditing firm. And so it's the same auditing firm that is performing the accounting, the accounting function. It's also the one that is also performing the audit. You are reviewing yourself and it creates a threat to independence for the auditor. Alright. So all these, uh, can create self-review threat for the auditor and, uh, a lot of, uh, uh safeguard you can put in place for example if you the 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 client has a source the accounting function to you you have to create a wall if between the guys that are, that are working as accountant for the auditors and guys that are going to work as the audit or audit, the auditor so you cannot use members of the same team to to do the accounting function and the auditing uh, function and like I've said before, when you perform compilation again, when you prepare financial statement for the for the uh, client, the client must take responsibility for that financial statement. You cannot take responsibility as auditors for the financial statement you are prepared uh, yourself. Okay. Uh, then you have advocacy threats. Advocacy could. Uh, 
come up in a situation whereby you comment publicly on future events. You know, there are some uh, of companies that do that. Even auditing firms, generally the big uh, auditing firm, you see them on newspapers, you know, making analysis, maybe on international standards, making on comments on auditing standards, making comments on IFRS, you know. So if those comments are actually favoring a cl client, it could become a problem because it's like you are advocating for that client. That's what it means. So it could backfire at the end of the day. Based on that, you can lose your independence. Situation where information is incomplete or where the argument being supported is against the law, the auditing firm could actually be advocating something that is against the law, which could backfire. Promoting shares in a listed company, which is also an audit client, is an advocacy threat. Acting as an advocate for an assured client, maybe in litigation, they sued your client, and you are now acting as an advocate, maybe as an expert witness for the uh, client. All these are uh, advocacy uh, threats that could meet, that could uh, impede the auditors uh, in the pendants. Then uh, familiarity traits, the auditors could become too familiar with the auditee, all right? So we are a member in a position to influence financial or non-financial reporting or business decision as an immediate family member who could benefit from those uh, decisions. It becomes a challenge, all right? And a uh, situation like that should be managed very, very well. When there is a family member in the audit, in the auditing firm that is related to a family, a, a person in the client's office, ensure that that person is not part of the team. Long association with business contact inflation, business decision. Like I've said before, an auditing firm auditing a company for 20 years. Forget the the independence has collapsed. I say in Nigeria. They brought a safeguard. Once you audit for a, a, a bank, the CBN came out with that rule. You audit for 10 years, you have to resign. You have to, to let go for another auditing firm to come. Uh, acceptance of gifts could also lead to familiarity threat. Over familiarity with the management of the generation could also compromise professional judgment. For example, an auditor has been in charge of an audit audit for the past 10 years. It's the same person that is heading the audit team for the past 10 years. There's no way professional judgment is going to be blood. A former partner of the firm is a director or officer of the client. All right? So you have a partner from the firm, resigning from the firm, and is now a director in the firm. It becomes an issue. How do you audit that director? Right, so the only way is that you have to bring somebody that is as that has a lot of uh, power, a lot of authority, to and uh, that is not too familiar with the person to be able to audit the job independently. All right, intimidation threat also could also arise. The directors could threaten the auditors that look, we are not retaining you next year if you continue like this. All right, you can threat. To, they can even try not to pay. Alright, they can try not to pay. They can try that they're going to, they can threaten you. They can threaten the, uh, they can threaten the auditors that they're not going to pay. They can threaten with that they're going to sue the, uh, the auditing firm. They can threaten that they're going to reduce the fee. Alright, so that they are, look, we are, we are, we, we can't pay up to this. So there are many intimidation threats that the auditors uh, could face in the in the course of performing their job. So those are the five uh, threats to independence or to ethical principles. And the safeguards, I've already started talking about them little by little. For example, there are some safeguards that are created by the profession. There are safeguards in the work environment. There are safeguards created by the auditor himself or herself. 
safeguard created by the profession, legislation or regulation include education, training, experience requirement for entry into the profession. You can't just wake up and say I want to be an auditor. It's a process you go through and that process will have left deposited some ethical constraints into the auditor. The continued professional development requirement, the CPE, I've talked about the MCPE requirement of ICANN. Corporate governance regulations is also there. For example, in UK, we have the Corporate Governance Code. It would be very good if you can review the Corporate Governance Code of UK. It's also similar to what we have adopted in Nigeria. All right, professional standards such as ISA, NSA is also there to guide the auditor. Professional regulatory monitoring and disciplinary procedures are also there. External review by legally empowered third party, all right, such as a government can, I've talked about the PCAOB in, uh, in America, uh, talk about FRC in the UK, all right, in Nigeria too we have uh, FRCN, all right, and so on. All these are safeguards provided by profession and the government. What about in the work environment of auditor safeguards that are there? Uh, you have the employer's own system of monitoring and ethics and conduct uh, programs. For example, you have internal training on ethics, you have mentoring program, you know, in the auditing firm. Okay, so there could be a system of monitoring system of institutionalizing ethics within the firm. With recruitment procedures, you have to recruit a right. That's where it starts. Ensuring that only high caliber competent staff are recruited. Alright. Disciplinary processes if auditors go wrong within the firm. Strong internal controls that should also be there. There should be leadership also within the organization within the firm. The partners, the managers have to show leadership ethically. Policies and procedures to implement and monitor the quality of employee performance should be there. Policies and procedures to implement and monitor the quality of engagement should also be there. Alright, then um, documented policies regarding the identification of threats to compliance with the fundamental principles and so on. Communication of sub policies and procedures and training to all the members of staff, use of different partners and engagement team for provision of non-assurance services to assurance client. Like I've said, you are auditing company A and you are also providing tax services for them. All right, or you are providing IT services for them. This audit team must be completely different from this IT team. So you have to separate the teams. Alright, or else, fine, all of them are from the same firm, but if it's the same team, this it is from the same pool, you are sending people to perform assurance service and non assurance service, independence is going to be seriously compromised. It's a big challenge in auditing, which we have to undo with care. Alright, uh, policy and procedure to stop individuals who are not members of the community from inappropriately influencing the outcome of the engagement that if somebody from outside the team cannot just come and try to muzzle himself or our way into the team or muzzle try to manipulate the members the team members to yes we want to look at uh, some review questions that will can help us to go over what we have uh, just learned uh, question number one says, what are the limitations of rule-based uh, code? Okay, remember we've said that the codes can be in two forms. It could be rules-based and it could be plain, simple, uh, based. Uh, rule-based means that uh, all forms of a scenario that could happen to the auditor on the field will have a mind, will be could be imagined and will be compiled, all right, and uh, giving instruction to the auditor. In this scenario, you must not take bribe. In that scenario, you must not eat. Anything that is more than 10,000 error, don't collect. 
okay don't sign this kind of document don't sign that that of document all right that'll be rule based compared to principle based where you know everything is just summarized as general to give a general direction to uh, the auditor okay so rules based have uh, several challenges that we have discussed in, discussed in the course of the video number one as we said is going to be highly voluminous because you have to think of so many things all right so many information so many scenarios that the auditor could face and uh, because of that uh, some facts some key f key instructions could even be lost in the midst of the volume it all happens like that when you have too much information that's what they call information overload all right so you have too, too much information that will be a challenge okay that will be a challenge uh, the number three okay there is no way actually there is no way you can imagine hundred percent all the kind of scenario that the auditor will face there are some institutions that will face that the auditor, what about in an imagine industry that people don't know too many for example cloud technology maybe and a company is involved in a cloud uh, cloud uh, is, a, is a cloud a, a cloud technology firm all right it's an imagine industry so what does the auditor in, do in a scenario like that okay so in novel cases uh, the auditor will be lost if you are using a uh, principle base and uh, people can always uh, find way around uh, you know look for loopholes people can do what is wrong when they know it is wrong all right but since it is not captured by the rules base they will still go ahead and do it and there's nothing you can do about it take them to court they will still win you all right because it's not stated in the rule base all right even though they know okay compared to principle base when it tells you for example integrity the auditor is expected to act with integrity all the time regardless of the scenario regardless of the uh, situation you are facing once you didn't ask with integrity then something is wrong so